Father in heaven, we are again so thankful that we get to gather here. We have the freedom to gather here and worship you. Um, we thank you and are grateful for everything you've done for us in our lives. And um, for the seasons that are coming up on us now, Thanksgiving and Christmas, we ask your blessings on those people who are ill in a way. And we thank you for Keith and his willingness to uh, teach us this morning. We ask your blessings on him and everyone here in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. So two Sundays ago, um, we looked at the first part of this idea of walking in submissiveness, which was a marital relationship, and how both the husband and the wife are responsible in their own part the wife to the husband's authority and the husband to the wife's need. As Christ submitted himself, we are to follow his example, that he submitted himself for the church and as a result delivered us free from sin. And we as husbands are supposed to be looking out for the needs of our wife. Today we are going to be looking at submissiveness in two areas. Um, the parent-child relationship, and yes, the slave-master relationship. Um, so what I want us to do is, first of all, read through um, Ephesians 6, 1 through 9. Um, yeah, could you start with the first three and then we'll go around. Ephesians 6, 1 through 3. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment with a promise, so that it may be well with you and that you may live long on the earth. Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. Slaves, be obedient to those who are your masters according to the flesh, with fear and trembling in the sincerity of your heart as is to Christ, not by way of eye service as men pleasers, but as slaves of Christ, doing the will of God from the heart. With good will, render service as to the Lord and not to men, knowing that whatever good thing each one does, this he will receive back from the Lord, whether slave or free. And masters, do the same things to them and give up threatening, knowing that both their master and yours is in heaven and there is no partiality with him. So again, we're looking here... This idea of submission that Paul is getting at is actually one that is a willing submission. In other words, this is a submission um, on the basis of our choice, how we choose to live our lives. The Bible talks about another kind of submission, and we see this in Matthew where Jesus calms the sea, and at the end of it... it um, it says this in, in Matthew 8, 27. The men were amazed and said, What kind of man is this, that even the winds and the sea obey him? This is a submission by the sheer force of God's power. That's not the kind of submission we're talking about here. These are not issues of force. These are issues of choice. And that's why Paul is encouraging us to do this. We also see here that he's saying, children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. So the first argument Paul gives is, this is right, that this is the right thing to do. It's important for us to understand that this is where Paul is coming from when he's talking about children and parents and obedience. 
Then it goes on and he says, Honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment with promise. Paul is making a very specific appeal to the fact that this is one of the Ten Commandments. But it is also the one that has a promise attached to it. This promise is so that it may be well with you and that you may live long on the earth. So Paul's saying that a long life is actually attributed somewhat to how we obey our parents. That's not always the case, but that is a very important distinction that there is a promise attached to this specific commandment. And we see some of the passages that talk about the consequences of disobedience as well as what disobedience truly means in terms of of the lives of children and, and their parents. And, and I want to read, um, or Mary. Could you read um, 1 Samuel 15, 22 and 23? You push the button there? It lights up? Samuel said, the Lord has much delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord. Behold, I obey, to obey is better than sacrifice and to heed than the fat of rams. For rebellion is as sin as div divination and insubordination is a, as iniquity and idolatry. Because you have rejected the word of the Lord, he has also rejected you from being king. So we see here a, a, con a consequence to Saul's disobedience to Sam's, Samuel's instructions. Samuel was told by God to tell Saul to do a certain thing. And Saul used um, the excuse, well, I, I wanted to, to do sacrifices. First of all, it wasn't Saul's place to offer sacrifices but he used that as an excuse for disobeying what God told Samuel and then through Samuel told Saul. And we see that there were consequences, that he lost the kingdom as a result of this. Then we see in 2 Timothy 3, 1 through 5, this, and, and Paul is talking to Timothy and he's, and he's talking about the, the um, di difficulty of the last days, and he says, but realize this, that in the last days, difficult times will come, for men will be lovers of self, lovers of money, <clears throat> boastful, arrogant, revelers, disobedient to parents, ungrateful, unholy, unloving, irreconcilable, malicious, malicious gossips, I should say, without self-control. Notice that, no self-control. Haters of good, treacherous, reckless, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, holding to a form of godliness, although they have denied its power. Notice Paul's instruction here. Avoid such men as these. This idea of being disobedient to parents. I wrote in my notes here. You might want to put it in there. Um, the book of Romans, chapter 1, verses 29 to 31, has a list that is very similar to this list. And both of them involve this idea of being in the list 
of all these things being disobedient to parents, that this is part of the list of those who, as we see, have a form of godliness but deny the power. And as Paul tells Timothy in this passage, avoid such men as these. He's saying don't associate with them. Don't be around people that don't listen to their parents, that don't want to live a godly life, that don't look at the scriptures as God's word and don't love God to follow him. So it's important for us to understand that we are to reach out to minister, but we are not supposed to associate with this kind of behavior. We are supposed to be holding ourselves apart from bad behavior so that we don't fall into the same traps, so that we don't start thinking that this bad behavior is something that's okay to follow. Colossians 3, 20 and 21 says this again, and Paul is saying very similar to what he says in Ephesians um, 6, 1, where it says, Children, obey your parents. In Colossians 3, 20 and 21, he says, Children, be obedient to your parents in all things, for this is well-pleasing to the Lord. Fathers, do not exasperate your children so that they will not lose heart. Notice something else here. Paul continues in verse 4 in Ephesians 6. He says, fathers, don't provoke your children to anger. That's what exasperating them means. But bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. And I believe that a key part of this is how are we living? Are we living in the dis discipline and instructions of the Lord. Because if we set that as our example, children will imitate that example. But we do need to correct them at times. It's important to understand that there are times for correction, but that those corrections can't be harsh or exasperating or arbitrary or not always there. They should be consistent. They should be firm. And they should also be something that um, sometimes kids will say, that's not fair. But you know what? Parents understand fairness is not what necessarily people see or what people think of it. Fairness is always being right. Now, no parent is perfect. That's why we have a Savior. But we should try to be like Christ as much as possible. And we see that Proverbs talks about this. And Proverbs... Mary, could you read Proverbs... Uh, 1324. Okay. He who withholds his rod hates his son, but he who loves him disciplines him diligently. So we see here that withholding discipline is actually not loving. Just like today we're seeing, oh, you're not being loving to people of certain persuasions because that's their belief. That's their way of doing things. That's their way of thinking. The problem is when they walk in that way, when they continue down that path and they never get turned away from it, they end up standing before God 
who is going to judge them for their continual sinful behavior. That's not love. It's not love when you don't turn somebody away or when you don't at least try or pray for people that have a need to turn away from their sin. We may not be able to come into contact with certain kinds of people or we may not see opportunities, but we can certainly take the opportunity to pray. To pray, if you will, for our nation, that our nation will turn itself around. We can also pray for those who are going out and telling others about the Lord and about their need of a Savior. And in our own lives, we should be telling others about their need of a Savior, even if it's not in words directly, but in actions. As a matter of fact, a lot of times people will say, your actions are speaking so loud, I can't hear a word you're saying. So our actions need to back up our words. We want to talk about living for Christ, and we should be living for Christ. Hebrews 1, or Hebrews 12, 5 through 11. Does somebody want to read that? And do you have forgotten the exhortation which is addressed to you as sons? My son, do not regard lightly the discipline of the Lord, nor faint when you are reproved by him. For those whom the Lord loves, he disciplines, and he scourges every son whom he receives. That continues on the next page. <laughs> it is for discipline that you endure. God deals with you as with sons. For what son is there whom his father does not discipline? But if you are without discipline, of which all have become partakers, then you are illegitimate children and not sons. I'll read the rest. Furthermore, we who had earthly fathers to discipline us, and we respected them, shall we not much rather be subject to the Father of spirits and live? For they disciplined us for a short time, as seemed best to them. But he disciplines us for our good, so that we may share his holiness. All discipline for the moment seems not to be joyful, but sorrowful. Yet, to those who have been trained by it, Afterwards, it yields the peaceable fruit of righteousness. So we see here, the author of Hebrews is talking about how the Father treats us as sons. And how does he treat us as sons? He disciplines us. When we sin, he brings us into line. A lot of times it's through circumstances. Other times it's through when we read the scriptures and he speaks to us through the scriptures showing us, you know, what you were doing there wasn't exactly right. And we need to repent of those sins and we need to understand that there are times when we will feel sorry. Even as Christians, there are times when it seems like the Lord has sometimes it even may seem like the Lord you have something to say, John? Right. But. 
Right. 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 The consequences of not having, as you put it, a fence or no rules. Um, we're seeing that in our country today where, yeah, there's this big talk about building a wall. Well, you know what? One of the consequences of that is how many young men or young adults are dying because of fentanyl that is being trafficked across the border. No fence leads to consequences. And sometimes those consequences are deadly. Right. Right. And 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 again, no consequences for actions lead to more destructive actions to the point where it becomes unmanageable and you know we're seeing that play out. We're seeing how not, how abandoning God has turned our country into something that is, that is just totally off the charts, going in the wrong direction. And it is a situation where we need to turn back to God. We need to turn back to God and we need to understand that discipline is part of that. That we need to understand that our lives need to be disciplined. Our children need to be disciplined. And again, we see this and I'm going to read this in Samuel uh, 3, ver chapter 3, 1 Samuel chapter 3, verses 12 and 13, where, where God is speaking to Samuel for the first time. And God says to Samuel, In that day I will carry out against Eli all that I have spoken concerning his house. Now it's important to understand, God has already told Eli these things. He's already told Eli, you need to get your kids in order. Eli didn't listen. And now God is using Samuel, and he's telling Samuel, this is what I want you to tell Eli. And he says, all that I have spoken concerning his house from beginning to end, for I have told him that I am about to judge his house forever for the iniquity of which he knew because his sons brought a curse on themselves and he did not rebuke them. We're seeing that kind of thing play out in this country where some of the bigger cities are going around and allowing criminals to just walk the streets without any consequences. No bail, that's right, no cash bail. Just a couple of days ago, a man raped another woman after having been arrested for that and was out without bail. Right in New York City. This is happening on a fairly regular basis. These are the consequences of not enforcing discipline. 
And it's only going to get worse if we don't enforce discipline. Discipline is correction to wrong actions. It's not a hateful thing. It's a loving thing. Because if we correct actions and a person is turned around and their lives are changed, then God has the chance to intervene and make them into new creatures. But if we don't correct that bad behavior, then what happens? Full on, headlong run over the cliff into eternal destruction. No other way around it. That's what the consequences are. So it's always in their best interest to warn them of the consequences and to interrupt their bad behavior to try and correct their behavior and also to intervene in their lives that they might hear the truth of who God is and what he has done for them. We then look at the slave-master relationship um, and I'm going to read the passage again where it's at 5 through 9 where Paul says, Slaves, be obedient to those who are your masters according to the flesh with fear and trembling in sincerity of your heart as to Christ, not by way of observance as men pleasers, but as slaves of Christ doing the will of God in the heart. With good will, render service as to the Lord and not as to men. Knowing that whatever good thing each one, one does, he will receive back from the Lord, whether slave or free. And masters do the same things to them and give up threatening, knowing that both master and that both their master and yours is in heaven and there is no partiality with him. Okay. Lehman Strauss in his book on Galatians and Ephesians um, actually does a quote here, and, and he's saying this. Um, he says, of course, we are not attempting here to apply this admonition to the unsaved. We agree with Dr. A.C. Gabion who has pointed out that slavery existing throughout the Roman Empire when the epistle was written was neither attacked by Paul, not even in his beautifully written and courteous letter to Philemon, which letter was about Onesimus, the runaway slave, reforming the world and improving social conditions is nowhere included in the biblical definition of the gospel. In other words, we don't adhere to a social gospel. We are not to preach social reform to the unsaved, but his message to the Christians. I just want to say that it was in actually the mid-1700s. There are two key figures in history, John Newton and William Wilberforce. They were both contemporaries. As a matter of fact, John Newton as an Anglican priest, advised William Wilber, Wilberforce to stay as an MP in the British legislature or the parliament. And it was over a long period of history that they kept working at the idea slavery is wrong. And it was that period of time that turned Western civilization around so that we started understanding that this is the case and that the Bible actually very strongly talks about slavery in terms of chattel slavery, which is essentially how slaves were appropriated in Africa 
was generally through kidnapping. And in Exodus 2, or ex ex Exodus 21, 16, the Bible says, He who kidnaps a man, whether he sells him or he is found in his possession, shall surely be put to death. It was a capital crime to kidnap and enforce slavery. Today's human trafficking in those days would have been considered a capital crime. And we're seeing that happening right now, even in our own country. Now, again, what does slavery have to do with most of us today? Well, if you look at what slavery was when the Bible talked about it in terms of Israel and the laws governing slavery, it was an issue of debt. A person ended up in debt to a point where they couldn't pay it back, so they traded their time pay off that debt. That's what slavery was about. And, and it's important to understand that these laws concerning the year of Jubilee and other, other issues where, where it's clear that people who couldn't pay their debt off even in their lifetime, they were supposed to be set free after a period of time because that's what the gospel is about, is we owed a debt that we could not pay. And when Jesus died on the cross, he nailed that certificate of debt to the cross. So as a result of that, we now are free from that debt. And that's what slavery was about. And here we can see that this, in a way, is talking about, it can be understood as talking about a relationship between someone who sells his time for money. That if I'm selling my time for money, whoever I'm selling that time to, I owe that time. I owe an honest day's work for an honest day's wages. On the other hand, a person who hires under false pretenses and either doesn't pay or asks something that is, shall we say, dubious at best, that that is not something that he should be doing. In other words, the employer should be acting in a conscientious manner toward the employee and the employee should be acting in a conscientious manner toward the employer because we are all servants of Christ and we should all understand that that's who we are. Okay, that's it. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for this time that we can come together and we thank you for the opportunity to look at our relationship with you as your children and how, as your children, we need to be honest, we need to live forthrightly with others, that we need to treat others in a way that we would want to be treated ourselves. We pray that you'd help us to grow in these things, that you'd help us to walk in obedience to you and as as a result, see your life work out in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen.